Good evening, I'm Patty James. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Lori Gottlieb. Lori Gottlieb is a psychotherapist and author of the New York Times bestseller, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, which is being adapted as a television series with Eva Longoria for ABC. In addition to her clinical practice, she writes the Atlantic's weekly Dear Therapist advice column and contributes regularly to the New York Times and many other publications. Her recent TED Talk is one of the top 10 most watched of the year. A member of the Advisory Council for Bring Change to Mind and advisor to the Aspen Institute, she's a sought-after expert in media such as The Today Show, Good Morning America, CBS This Morning, CNN, and NPR's Fresh Air. She's also the co-host of the new iHeart Radio podcast, Dear Therapists, produced by Katie Couric. Welcome, Lori. Thank you so much, Patty. Of course. I enjoyed your book. It was um, funny and tearful and just a very interesting read. I, I learned a lot, so thank you for that. You started out as a writer and, and, and as a very successful writer, and then you became a mom. You had your son, and you went back to school to become a therapist, and then in the uh, therapist vernacular that I learned from your book, you had your presenting problem, your maybe I should talk to someone, maybe you should talk to someone problem, which seems to be the catalyst for this book. Could you explain your journey? Yeah. So, um, you know, first of all, this wasn't a book that I ever expected to write. Um, as you can see in the book, I sort of describe the the process of of coming into a place where this was something that I wanted to put out into the world. Um, I had originally, uh, I'm, I'm a writer for The Atlantic, and so I had written a cover story called How to Land Your Kid in Therapy, Why Our Obsession with Our Kids' Happiness Might Be Dooming Them to Unhappy Adulthood. Mm -hmm. And that piece just went viral, and publishers wanted me to write that book, and I did not want to write that book. And um, you know, it's it's interesting because when you when you talk about somebody wanting you to write a book and and turning it down, it sounds very much like a good problem to have. But I think what was happening at that time was that I was starting out as a therapist, and and I think you can't really do the work that you're doing as a therapist and not feel like um, meaning and purpose are at the core of your experience in every aspect of your life. And I did not want to write an overparenting book. I felt like I said what I wanted to say in that piece. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I'm really interested in what's happening with the adults. And they said, oh, you want to write a happiness book? <laughs> and I said, no, I don't want to write a happiness book. But you know, I figured we would sort of work that out. And basically, I ended up being in contract to write a happiness book. And um, it ended up that I say in the book that, that I called it the miserable depression inducing happiness book because the <laughs> happiness book would make me miserable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that happiness is a byproduct of living our lives in a meaningful way is what we all strive for. But happiness as the goal in and of itself is often a recipe for disappointment. And so eventually I canceled that book. And I said, I just want to bring people into what I get to see every day as a therapist. It's really a privilege to be able to sit in a room with people and to really experience the human condition in that way in people's lives. And so um, I, I, in the book, I, I actually bring people into the therapy room and we follow the lives of for very seemingly different patients as they go through various struggles. But there's a fifth patient in the book, and the fifth patient is me as I go through my own struggle and I go to a therapist. So it's really a lens into the human condition from both the perspective of me as therapist, me as clinician, and also me as patient. Yes, um, it, it's. I enjoyed how you weaved those stories together, and um, you know, and the aggravation and of some of your patients, and the sadness, and the joy, and the watching them grow. And you were going through so much yourself at the time. So I'm kind of curious as to how your journey. You know, were you more because of what you're going through? Do you feel like maybe you were more empathetic, or 
or near tears when you heard their stories? How did their stories, you could even take one of your patients, like John, the one that was the most aggravating at first, and it was fun to watch (laughs) him grow. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You know, I I say at the very beginning of the book that my most significant credential is that I'm a card-carrying member of the human race. And that was why I included myself in the book. I felt like it would almost be disingenuous to position myself as the expert up on high, because I think that as therapists, we use our humanity in the room all the time. I don't think anybody wants to go and talk to somebody who's a robot, right? So we know what it's like to be a person in the world. Um, And so, of course, my patients always hold up a mirror to me. And the very questions that they have to ask themselves about their lives are the questions that I, of course, have to ask myself about my own life. And so the reason that I picked the the people that I did was that they seem very different on the surface and all five of us seem very different from one another. But underneath it all, once you get to know what's going on with each of us, you start to see that we're all more the same than we are different, in fact, no matter how wildly different our lives might look. And I think that that's that's why the book, I think, has resonated so widely is because I think that the reader says at the end, I saw myself in every single one of these people, even if at the beginning, I didn't see what the connection would be. And so when you mentioned John, John is this um, person who is in his 40s and he's married and he has kids and he's very successful in his career. And he has insomnia and he has a lot of anxiety and he kind of blames it on everybody else. You know, everybody else is the problem. And, um, you know, when I was training, I remember a supervisor once said, before diagnosing someone with depression, make sure they aren't surrounded by assholes, right? And so I, I think that, you know, of course, there are difficult people in difficult circumstances in the world, but we also have to look at our own role in those circumstances. How are we responding to those difficult people? How are we responding to those difficult circumstances? And, um, John was very off-putting. He was very hard to like at first. He in his very in the very first session, he was insulting to me. Um, you know, he was very abrasive. And people said, "Well, why would you treat someone like that?" So he was he was very offensive in that first session. And and I think that it's because a lot of the time when there's something unspeakable, when there's something that's so painful, we can't actually have the words to share that it comes out in our behaviors. And so I knew that there was some great pain that he was experiencing that he just couldn't talk about. And it was coming out in a way where he would keep everyone at a distance, keep everyone at bay. So they couldn't get close to him, meaning they couldn't get close to his pain. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that John is, as much as people dislike him at the very, you know, in the first 10 pages of the book, um, I think they come to maybe love him the most by the end of the book. Yeah. And, and, um, you you mentioned in the book too that something even I believe at that first session with John that somehow you felt that you might end up liking him. I liked him better, by the way, after I knew about his dog. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Well, you know, training one of my clinical supervisors said that there's something likable about everyone. Yeah. And then she said it's your job to find it. And I love that because I remember at the time being very skeptical, thinking, yeah, that's a very nice sentiment. But in real life, you know, does that really play out? And I think that it actually is true. I've discovered as a therapist that there is something likable about everyone and it is my job to find it. Mm -hmm. But part of it is it's their job to let me in, to let me see them. Mm -hmm. And so I think for the people who keep the mask on, for the people who, you know, they distract you, like, look over here, look over here, look over here with every story. And they won't let you see the truth of who they are. It's very hard to like them, not because they aren't likable, but because they won't let me see the most likable parts of themselves. The irony of having the mask on is that people think that if I, if I, if I have this, you know, if there's this performative aspect, right, that we all have in our lives, that we, we want to project a certain image. And I think that people think they're projecting the image that's most likable, but what people find most likable and what connects people to one another is taking off the mask, is showing the truth of who you are. And I think that's where we can see, oh yeah, I see you, I hear you, I understand you, because I can see some commonality with you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you have an analogy that I, I, uh, I enjoyed thinking about afterwards. You talk about how do we stop shaking the bars? Explain what shaking the bars is. Yeah. So I think that a lot of us feel trapped by our circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I write in the book about the difference between idiot compassion and wise compassion. So idiot compassion is what we do with our friends. They say, you know, here's what happened and isn't it awful? And we say, yes, it's awful. That person is awful, right? Your boss, your partner, whatever, um, your parent. And, and that's not really helpful because if you really listen to your friends, a lot of the time they're telling you the same story over and over, but with different you know, different details, different circumstances. It's kind of like if a fight breaks out in every bar you're going to, maybe it's you. But we don't say that to them. And what a therapist does is they offer wise compassion, which is we hold up a mirror to people and we help them to see something about themselves that maybe they haven't been willing or able to see. And that helps them get unstuck. And so I was doing the former when I went to my therapist and I was talking about about why, you know, this situation was something that I couldn't change. And he said to me, you know, you remind me of this cartoon and it's of a prisoner shaking the bars, desperately trying to get out. But on the right and the left, it's open, right? no bars. In other words, the prisoner isn't actually in prison. And so the question is, why don't we walk around walk around where it's open, right? Why do we sit there shaking the bars? And sometimes we would prefer to shake the bars and say, you know, I'm the victim here and, and, and I'm trapped and I'm in jail. Because if we walk around the bars, with that freedom comes responsibility. And a lot of the times we don't take want to take responsibility for our lives because if we take responsibility for our lives, then, you know, if things don't go well, only we are to blame. We can't blame it on other people. And sometimes blaming it on other people is a more comfortable place to be. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a very, very helpful um, cartoon, you know, to mention. And I think metaphor comes up a lot in therapy and, mm -hmm. and images and metaphor because they help us to see something that, that we can't see or we haven't otherwise been able to see. Yes, that was a question a, a, a few down from now, the, the idiot compassion versus wise compassion. compassion, And, and, and you explained what they are, uh, so we know the difference now. But how come that so many of us, maybe we can see so clearly that other people are trapped and they're not walking around those doors, but we can't always see it for ourselves. What do yeah. we do about that? Well, <laughs> you know, I kind of, I, it's true. And I, I think that the advantage of therapy is it's almost like getting a really good second opinion on your life from someone who is not in your life. And the key piece of this is that the person is not in your life. The therapist is not in your life in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that when we're in our own lives, we're zoomed in so closely. Imagine a picture and you're zoomed in so closely that you can't see the broader picture. And when you zoom out, all of a sudden things become clear. You gain that clarity because you can see more. And so I think that's what happens in therapy is it's sort of like the zoomed out version of your life that you didn't have the perspective to see because you were too close to it yourself. And so are the people in your life. They're too close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, there's something else you wrote that, that I liked. It, it's, I, and I think it's helpful. Happiness is reality minus expectations. What do you mean by that? Or, or how do we, how do we actually get to that point? Yeah. So, so what I was talking about was how I, you know, when I was sort of really struggling with writing the happiness book and there were all of these studies about happiness and that was one of them. And they had sort of boiled down happiness to these equations yeah. and what an I actual see is a <laughs> right, an actual equation yeah. um, and a very complicated one at that. Yes. And you can see the whole equation in the book um, yeah. because it's a very long line. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, I understand what they're trying to do, but at the same time, I think that what people are coming to therapy for is they might think they're coming for happiness, but I think what they're really coming for is peace is a sense of peace with themselves. Mm -hmm. And and it's interesting because when I when I give talks, often I will say to people, um, you know, show of hands, who is the person that you talk to most in the course of your life? Is it your partner? Lots of hands go up. You know, is it your parent? Is it your best friend? Is it your sibling? Lots of hands go up for those those categories. But really the person that we talk to most in the course of our lives is ourselves. 
And what we say to ourselves isn't always kind or true or helpful. Mm -hmm. And so I had a patient who was very self-critical and she couldn't see that. And so I said, I want you to go home and I want you to write, li really listen for that voice. Mm -hmm. And I want you to write down everything that you say to yourself over the course of a few days and then come back and we'll talk about it. And so she comes back and she's got her, she's written it all down and she starts to read it. And she says, you know what? I can't even read this. I am such a bully to myself. I did not realize that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's really important for us to consider that a lot of the time, we don't even realize that there's this voice in our heads that it's like a bad radio station that we're listening to all the time. And it's really critical. And all we need to do is change the dial, but we don't because we don't even know that it's on in the background. We haven't, we're not even paying attention to it. And yet it is driving so much of our mood and our behavior on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago reading a book by Dr. Carolyn Mace, and she says your um, uh, biography becomes your biology. So I suppose this mm. voice in our head, the, you know, these thoughts that become things um, affect our, our obviously mental well-being, but physical well-being as well. Well, that's right. So when I say that, you know, I don't think people are coming in for happiness. I think they're coming in for peace. I think they're coming in for a sense of how can I navigate through the world more smoothly? Mm -hmm. And there's very much a connection between our emotional health and our physical health. Mm -hmm. And yet I think the irony of that is that we don't pay attention to that and we treat our physical health very differently. And that's where I think, you know, there isn't stigma around something happening to our bodies, but there's very much stigma around something happening emotionally to us. So for example, you know, I, I think we minimize it when we're struggling emotionally and we don't do that physically. You know, we don't compare our pain. I say in the book, there's no hierarchy of pain, that pain is pain because we tend to minimize you know, maybe you're feeling anxious or you're feeling sad. Um, you know, people will say, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to go get that checked out because other people have it so much worse than me. I have a roof over my head and food on the table. So there's no reason for me to be feeling this way. If you have a broken leg, you don't say, I'm not going to go to the doctor because somebody else has cancer, right? You don't compare your ailments mm -hmm. in that way. Yeah. And so I think it's really important that when we are, when something feels off in our bodies, we go and get it checked out. And when something feels off emotionally, often people don't come to therapy until they're having the equivalent of an emotional heart attack, right? Right. Um, and, and by then they've suffered unnecessarily for a long time. And also it's harder to treat because now you're in crisis. Whereas if you would just come when the problem first presented itself, we could have dealt with it much differently. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, Anxiety and depression. You know, in the Buddhist world, anxiety is worrying about tomorrow, which uh, we all know we have no control over for the most part. And depression is, is thinking about yesterday. Neither one, of course, has to do with today. So do you agree in that analogy? And is this age that we live in filled with both, and we know it is, then how can the average person recognize this and cope with everything? Yeah, that's such a good point, especially given what we're experiencing right now in the current moment. And I think that, you know, a lot of people say there are certain feelings that they attribute, um, you know, they'll say there's, there are negative feelings and there are positive feelings. So positive feeling is joy and a negative feeling is anxiety or depression mm -hmm. or sadness rather. Um, and, and really there's, there's feelings are our feelings, right? We need to feel our feelings because they tell us what direction to go in. Our feelings are like a compass. And if you aren't feeling your feelings, it's not like they go away. What happens is they get pushed down and they come out through our behaviors. They come out in insomnia or in a short temperedness or in too much food or wine or mindless scrolling through the internet. So we've all experienced that. That's a feeling that we're saying, I don't want to feel that feeling, but yet that feeling is there. Um, so I think what's really important is that we don't say, oh, I'm having anxiety. That's a negative feeling. There are actually two kinds of anxiety. There's productive anxiety, and then there's unproductive anxiety. So right now in the current moment, that distinction is important because productive anxiety is when you are feeling anxious about something and it's a reasonable 
response to something, and it makes you take an action that will protect you. So we are reasonably worried about the coronavirus, and so we are wearing masks, we are social distancing, we are taking all the precautions that we need to take. If we weren't worried about the coronavirus, we would just act like nothing's happening and things would be a lot worse, right? So we are actually using our anxiety, productive anxiety, in a productive way to protect ourselves. Unprotective anxiety, on the other hand, is obsessive rumination. It's that circus in your head. It's like, let me check all the latest headlines and that's going to rile me up more. And let me think about what's going to happen in an hour and next week and next month and a year from now. And that's not really helpful. So what you were talking about, about being staying in the present is really helpful. What can I do right now that is productive? Um, you know, and, and what that means is you're taking the, the measures that you need to take, but then also you are protecting your psychological immune system. So we're talking so much about our physical immune systems and protecting ourselves from the virus physically, but we need to protect our psychological immune systems. And if you inundate your, your, yourself with all of this, this fear all the time of something that you can't do anything about, you're going to wear down your psychological immune system. So just like we need to eat healthy and sleep well, that helps our physical immune system. Psychologically, can you connect with people? Um, in a way that's safe? Can you do things that are nourishing to you? Maybe it's reading a book, maybe it's calling a friend, maybe it's, um, you know, sleeping well, whatever it is, but what is psychologically nourishing to you and making sure that we're doing that instead of just mindlessly scrolling through the internet or reading all the headlines that are going to make us even more anxious. You need to know what's going on, but you don't need to know what's going on minute by minute. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I never thought about levels of anxiety. I know there's levels of stress. There's stress, everyday stress. And then there's, you know, there's challenge stress. You're learning to, mm -hmm. uh, to tango. You're learning a new language. It's a whole different type of, of stress. So in interesting that there are different types of anxiety. That's a really helpful point. Here at the Commonwealth Club, we always try to give people a lot of take-homes. And I think that was um, a very important take-home for, for most people. So thank you for that. So, yeah, you, yeah you, you talk about monologues versus dialogues. So monologue is obviously, you know, you can have a monologue with yourself. You can be somebody right in front of you and you're still having a monologue because you're the only one talking versus a dialogue. So how can the average person recognize that they're not in a dialogue, even though they might think they are, and that they're in, that they're just talking. So, and even with ourselves. So I think that if you would expand a little bit on monologues versus dialogues. Yeah. So I think that what that really comes down to is learning how to listen. And I think that a lot of us don't know how to listen. Um, I think that a lot of the time, first of all, we don't bother to ask the person when they're talking to us what they want out of that conversation. And I see this, I see a lot of couples in my practice, and this comes up a lot, where one person thinks that they're really helping the other person, and the other person is getting really frustrated because it's not helpful at all, because they're not listening in the way that the person needs. So you might want to get curious about, you know, what does the person want out of this conversation? Are they wanting to just vent? Are they wanting um, your thoughts on it? Are they wanting you to help them come up with a solution? Are they wanting you to give them a solution? Are they wanting just to hug? What are they wanting? And just knowing that changes the entire tenor of a conversation. And I think the other thing is that when people are listening, um, it's not just listening to the words. I always say that as a therapist, what I'm listening for is I'm listening for the music under the lyrics. The lyrics are the content, the words that people are using. And the music is the body language. And what is the underlying struggle or pattern that the person is really talking about? And if you can connect with the music under the lyrics, you're going to have a much more productive conversation. And the person is going to feel much more seen and heard than if you just focus on, you know, the content, just the words that they're using. And a lot of times when people are talking, somebody is coming up with their response. They're not really listening. They're coming up with their, you know, what they're going to say next instead of really sitting with, okay, I want to stay with what this person is saying. And then I can take a breath. And then I can think about how I want to respond. In your book, you talk about your own therapist, who you call Wendell in the book, and how your first time there, you just were, just wanted him to agree with you. And he didn't. And you, you knew what everything he was doing because you're a therapist yourself. And But then he just very, just 
didn't agree with you. And you just had to eventually work things out on your own. And I think that was um, a kind of a big lesson for you, was it not? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in the book and also in my TED Talk, I talk about the fact that we're all unreliable narrators, that (laughs) it's not that we're lying. It's that we see a story, we see a situation through a particular lens, a subjective lens. And so what happens is people come in and they have this faulty narrative. And, you know, there's parts of the story that they're leaving in, there's parts of the story that they're leaving out, there's parts that they're emphasizing and minimizing. Um, The supporting characters might actually be main characters and vice versa. Who are the victims and who are the heroes in this story? And maybe there's some confusion around that. Um, Is the protagonist moving forward or is the protagonist going in circles? So it's really when people come in, what they're coming in with is a story. That's how we make sense of our lives is through story. Just think in, in your everyday life, how you talk to people. You're telling stories. You're hearing stories. And so because I have this writing background, I think that I really think about people's problems as stories. And so I feel like when I'm sitting in the therapist chair, I'm really being an editor in a lot of ways. And I'm helping them to edit their faulty narrative. I'm helping them to see parts of the story that they haven't been able to see. That And th- what that does is it opens them up to so many possibilities that they hadn't seen before. Mm-hmm. And it also helps them to clarify, you know, how are they contributing to this problem? How are they, why are they stuck? Because if they're coming in, they're already stuck. There's something that's keeping them stuck or they wouldn't be coming in in the first place. So what is, what is keeping them stuck at this point in the story and how can we help revise that? Mm-hmm. Um, something that uh, you talked about uh, is a Carl, Carl Young and, and he talked about, and you were expanded on it, was the collective unconscious or ancestral memory. And that really stuck with me because I, am concerned about our young people and, and so, you know, and how if we're talking ancestral uh, memory and this collective unconscious that we, I know we all feel right now. So how would you explain this? And if you think it's more relevant today than other times, I realize you, we didn't live in other times. That's probably not the greatest question, but what do we do to help us particularly our children, get through this time. And so they don't bring this ancestral stress down to their children, which I, you know, is evidently is a real thing. Right. So in the, in the book, I was talking about um, our dreams and how, you know, there are certain themes in our dreams and, and um, you know, how that gets sort of inflated with other experiences. And I think right now when there's Um, a a stressor that we're all experiencing, but we're going to experience it differently. Um, A lot of times trauma brings up past trauma. So there's, and I I think that some people chafe at the word trauma for what we're experiencing right now, but it is a really traumatic time. And so I think for people who have experienced a lot of challenge or difficulty in their lives, this will bring that up again for them in ways that maybe they hadn't expected. So there's sort of like a layered, um, a layered difficulty that they're going through right now. Um, and, and so I think that's important. And so I think when we talk to our kids about what's going on, it's really important for parents not to try to talk our kids out of their feelings. Because if you don't talk about what's going on, it will come out later in different ways, sort of like what I was talking about earlier. But sometimes this will come out years later. And so it's really important to be able to say, you know, what's going on with you? And when your kids say that they're anxious or they're sad, instead of trying to cheer them up, you know, often we try to talk them out of their feelings because their discomfort makes us uncomfortable because we are uncomfortable with the idea that they will experience pain. And we feel like our job is to help them, um, is to, is to take away their pain. And that is not our job at all. Our job is to say, here is something that you're experiencing and I want you to be able to sit with that feeling and know that you're resilient and know that you're going to get through it. And so they might say that they're, you know, they're sad, they can't see their friends or they don't like the remote learning or, you know, they're afraid, um, uh, you know, just because people are walking around with masks, whatever it might be. And, and instead of saying like, oh, you know, no, don't be afraid. It's okay. You're trying to cheer them up to just be able to say, you know, three words tell me more. If you can just say, tell me more, they can hear themselves think. So when we talk over them, we are actually talking over their inner voice and their inner experience. And then they don't even know what they feel anymore. 
So the best thing we can do for them is to just listen, going back to what we were saying about listening, to just say, tell me more. And to and then to help them, instead of saying, well, here's what you should do about it, to say, okay, well, what do you think would help? And often they have great ideas. We don't give them enough credit. You know, just ask them, what do you think would help right now? And let them just keep talking. And what else? And what else? And they will come up with something that, and they will feel really good about themselves for having come up with a solution on their own. It's not a solution to the coronavirus. It's a solution to what can I do right now that will help me to deal with this difficult moment better? And that's a really good skill for them to learn to have. Oh, that's wonderful. Really wonderful. Thank you for that. So... There's a quote, I don't remember, I'm sorry if it was your quote or someone's, we can't have change without loss. And I, I sat on that one for a while and I'm wondering about the semantics. I mean, you, we can all look back at our lives and something at the time that was a loss, whether it be a partner or a job, you know, it could have been a job that we really didn't like or a partner that we maybe really didn't like. <laughs> so um, so how do, is there a way in, in that we can reframe that, do we ha- can't have change without loss. So maybe it really wasn't a loss, I guess is, is the point I'm trying to make here. So uh, any suggestions as how in we can think about those things that happen think at, at the time that they're happening and maybe do some reframing Right, well, I do heads? think, yeah, I mean, what I'm saying there is that, that even with positive change, like you're getting married or you got a job promotion or you're having a baby, Um, People get really excited about those things. And yet we need to acknowledge that even with positive change, there is loss. And that's why it's so hard to change because what we lose is we lose the familiar, even if the familiar, you know, was something that you wanted to change. Mm -hmm. Um, Humans don't do well with uncertainty. And every time there's a change, we're going into something that we haven't yet experienced. Mm -hmm. And so there is some loss with that. Um, And so when you don't acknowledge that, sometimes people get really resistant to the change and they don't understand why they're not enjoying the change as much as they think they should be enjoying it. Um, There's a chapter in the book called How Humans Change. And it talks about how when we make changes, it's not like the Nike slogan, just do it. It doesn't really work that way, at least for the long term. That's why New Year's resolutions are notorious for not lasting very long. Mm -hmm. Um, Really, there there are all these different stages and I go through them in the book. There's sort of the pre-contemplation where you don't even know that you're thinking about making a change. And then there's, um, you know, your contemplation where you're contemplating the change. And then you're sort of thinking about, you know, how might I make this change? And, And there's a lot that goes into it before you actually take action. And then you're making the change. And then the most important stage of change isn't actually making the change. It's maintaining the change. It's the maintenance phase. And people misunderstand the maintenance phase. They think that you're just going to maintain the change but that's not what happens. It's really hard to maintain a change. And so you're going to regress, you're going to slip up. And that's a normal part of the maintenance phase. But a lot of people, like let's take an example of of going on a diet, right? So somebody will say, okay, so I'm eating in a healthier way. And then let's say they have a day where they really didn't eat healthy at all. And they think, oh, well, I failed at that. So I'll just go back to my old way of eating. Well, no, you didn't fail at that. You just, it's really hard to change. So then you can just go back to healthy eating again and know that some days are going to be harder than others. Whenever we make a change, we have to be really realistic and really compassionate. Self-compassion is so important when you're making a change. And people think that if they self-flagellate, that that will help them change more. And it's the opposite. You know, they kind of are are the taskmaster and they think, well, if I'm really hard on myself, then I'm going to be able to change. No. If you have more um, compassion for yourself, you will actually, it will be easier to hold yourself accountable because you're going to be kinder to yourself. And when you're kinder to yourself, you don't feel as much shame when you do regress. Mm -hmm. And so you're able to pick up the pieces and move forward with the change much more easily. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, that was my next question. You you went right through it perfectly, <laughs> but and I have all sorts of arrows to maintenance too because in the nutrition world, which is my world and health science, uh, it's the first of the year. It's like everybody's going to make all they make 
all these New Year's resolutions that are gone because, you know, two weeks later because um, they think they can do everything at once. And small, sustainable steps to health are, uh, you know, are more realistic for most people. And also, when you're talking about behavior, I, I think of BJ Fogg and, and his work on behavior change and how you build new habits from existing habits. So I would yes. think if you can do that, you can do that with our mental health as well, right? Well, right. I think, you know, most of the changes that we make um, are coming from so many small, almost imperceptible steps that we took along the way. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I have this, I have this new podcast that just came out last week called Dear Therapists um, at iHeartRadio, and you can hear it wherever you listen to podcasts. Katie Kirk is producing it. And it's me and my co-host, Guy Winch, who um, also has done several TED Talks and um, and has written some books like me. And he is the advice columnist for TED, and I am the advice columnist for The Atlantic. And so we kind of join forces. And one of the things we do when we talk about change is we have, you know, the, the time that it takes to do a podcast, to talk to a guest, um, really get into, you know, what is keeping them stuck. And then we give them advice. And then they go off and try it and they have one week to try the advice and they come back and tell us how it went. Mm. And so when we talk about change, we want to give them something that's actionable that they can do in a week and to see what changes. And often what what you'll hear on the podcast and our our second episode went up today, um, but you'll hear this more as as more of them drop, is that um, like the one that went up today is a woman who is, is uh, she, her boyfriend is a divorced dad and she doesn't have children, but um, she's having trouble with the, the, the boyfriend's daughter who doesn't like her very much at all. Mm. And we gave her one thing to do. And we actually gave her several things to do, but she tried one of them. And so much happened by just changing that one thing. And I think people feel like, oh, I have to do it all. I have to make all these changes at once. And that's not really that helpful. If you can make one small change and you'll see some results from that and then you make another change and it builds on the first change, right? And so I think it's um, it's really important for people to be realistic about the kinds of changes that they're making because they're going to feel so good when they make one small change and they actually see a result from that. So you ultimate concerns, death, isolation, freedom, meaninglessness. So um, is there a way to transmute to positives? Okay, death, I don't know. (laughs) Isolation, freedom, meaningless. How can we take these four ultimate concerns that you talk about? um, What do we do about these in our real life, in our everyday lives? Mm -hmm. How do we... How do we deal with all these big ultimate concerns, these four? So those are actually Irvin Yalom's, um, what he categorized as the ultimate concerns. And he's a, a psychiatrist yes. um, up where you are in the Bay Area. And, um, and you know, it's interesting because I think the way he talks about them is counterintuitive. It's not what we expect. And one of the one of the things that I noticed was, let's just take death, for example, right? So I think that even though my book is very funny, death is can be found throughout the book. And, and I think that's because when we don't think about death, we act in ridiculous ways. We don't realize, wait a minute, my time is limited and I really have to be intentional. And so there's this woman that I treat in the book and she is this young woman who is in her early 30s. She has just come back from her honeymoon and she discovers that she has breast cancer. And ultimately it ends up that she is later going to discover this terminal cancer. And she asked me if I'll stay with her until she dies. And what she really did was she forced me to really look death in the eye in a way that most of us shy away from. And it was, people said, well, it wasn't that depressing. And I said, no, actually it was really invigorating. There was so much vitality in our sessions because I think that what she did was, and she wasn't, you know, I think a lot of times people think of the, the trope of the cancer patient as saint, right? She was not that at all. She was angry and rageful and terrified and all of those things. But what she also did was she said, why does it take a terminal diagnosis for people to live with intention, to really do what they want to do? Why does it take even now in COVID? Why are all of a sudden people are saying, I think a silver lining of COVID is people are saying, what are my priorities? What matters to me? Right? Because they realize that life is fragile. And I think that if we could hold death on one shoulder, and I don't mean in 
a way that feels paralyzing, Mm. but rather in a way that feels invigorating to say, listen, life has a hundred percent mortality rate. And that's not just for other people. (laughs) And so if we can keep that in mind and say, why don't I, why don't I think about the fact every day when I wake up, not that like, what would you do if you had one day to live and you would go to Paris? That's not realistic. Right. But to think about what are my priorities? What, what matters to me? Who matters to me? Um, And to really be aware of that. And so I think that when we think about our ultimate concerns, we should be concerned about the fact that we're going to die. Because if we aren't concerned about that, we won't actually live. We will get to this place later on, close to the time when we are going to die, and say, I am full of regret because I didn't think about the fact that I had a limited time and I didn't take advantage of the life that I had. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, This is, and then we have some questions from our audience too, but... You say in the book um, that there are 30 million Americans that end up, I think you put it, on uh, therapist couches every year. So just because of, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of underserved populations and 30 million people might end up on a therapist couch, but there's 300 million that many of those can't afford a therapist. So for the average person, your book is full of so many tips and so much information that a lot of people won't know about. How do we, how do we get this information out? And a side question, a side part to that is the TV show that's going to be made from your book. Is that going to be a vehicle for getting out um, all the all these tips, all this information that is packed in your book to people who might not read your book or might not hear about it. You know, not everybody's going to talk to a minister or a rabbi or a school counselor. They're just going to not know how to deal with this. How do we help those people? Yeah. Well, I think that's that's why so many people are reading the book. I think because people really want to understand themselves better. They want to understand the people that they love better. Um, you know, when I, when I canceled the happiness book and I decided that I was going to write this book, everyone said, no one's going to read this book. So I was very open and raw and vulnerable in the mm-hmm. book with my story as well. And it, because I thought like three people will read this. And so I want to write the book that will at least be useful to those three people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I handed it into my publisher, um, they had this very big reaction to it, which was they were passing it around to everybody. They were, they said, I laughed, I cried, I saw myself in it, and I learned so much. And so I thought, okay, well maybe 300 or 3000 people will read this Um, And I had this moment of, well, maybe I should sort of clean myself up in the book, (laughs) right? Because now actually it won't be just those three people. Um, But I'm so glad I didn't because, you know, the book, you know, was on the New York Times bestseller list for over a year. And, um, and, and I think that the reason that it's really resonating with people is because I didn't clean myself up is because it's very real and people can see themselves in the book and learn something about themselves and understand themselves and and the world around them so much more clearly. So I don't think that therapy should be this thing where you're like a wizard with tricks and and people don't know. I you know I'm I'm very transparent about sort of here's what I'm thinking and here's what I'm saying and here's why. And so I think that people can translate that into oh, now I know how to talk to myself about this too or I know how to talk to the people that I care about in this way. And so the title of the book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, isn't just you know a nod toward, well, maybe you should talk to someone and go see a therapist. Mm-hmm. It's maybe we should talk more to one another. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what people are taking away from the book. So it's not so much everybody needs to go to therapy. It's that everybody needs to learn to connect in a more nourishing way with one another. Oh, absolutely. You say in therapy, change can happen gradually and then suddenly. Explain that. Yeah. So that's sort of a nod to what I was talking about earlier, which is that change doesn't happen all at once. So in that chapter in the book, How Humans Change, you see, and you just see in all the stories of the four people that we follow in the book and in my story too, that sometimes it takes a lot of, a a lot of not changing, right? There's like week after week after week, and we're not changing. We think we're not changing because we don't see the action phase happening, but all the other ingredients are there and there's a lot percolating beneath the surface. And so we are preparing ourselves for change. We are changing. We maybe haven't manifested that change yet. Um, But then you see it 
You see it happen. You see the change. You see someone do something that before was impossible for them to do. They take a risk that they never would have taken before. They branch out. They come out of their shell. Um, you know, they their voice is heard. They they react differently to something that's very provocative in a way they never thought possible. And so that's when it seems like it's very sudden, but it wasn't sudden. They had they there was this gradual process of coming into I think that place of of being ready, that place of readiness. I always, when people come into therapy, I'm always, you know, asking that question, not only why are you here, but, but why now? I want to know why this day, this week, this month, Mm -hmm. did they pick up the phone and call me when maybe the problem that they're coming in for has been there for quite some time? And so I'm not just looking for what's not working, but I'm scanning for strengths. And one of those strengths is readiness. And the fact that they called and they made that they made that appointment and they drove to the appointment or now we're zooming into these appointments. Um, you know, the fact that they're doing that means that there's some readiness there. Mm-hmm. And so that to me is a strength. And I think that when we talk about change happening gradually, then suddenly the fact that they called, that's the first step right there. That's the gradual part of change. They've already started the change process by virtue of simply making the appointment and coming in. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And the last 10 minutes um, that we have, we have some questions. We have um, a woman that writes, I'm 90 years old and I'm alone and your journey helps me. Uh, Her question is, how does one cope with loneliness? Yeah. So I think there's a difference between loneliness and solitude. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, you see in the book, the story of Rita, who is this woman who is about to turn 70 and she's very alone in the world for a lot of different reasons. And her situation seems very sad and and almost bleak. And, And she ends up reaching out in all kinds of ways and in, in, in joining the human, you know, the, the, the human race again in a way that she hadn't. And I think a lot of the times when we're alone, we feel like, well, this is my situation and I have to accept it and I have to find a way to cope with being alone and and also being lonely. So some people are not lonely when they're alone, but sometimes people are. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And so I think that for somebody who is alone, it's really important to reach out to people during this time, especially. And so what does that look like? Well, I'll tell you something funny from the therapy room. A lot of the people that I see who are maybe they are married or they have kids. They are saying, listen, I love the people that I'm with, but they're driving me crazy. The same quirks, the same anecdotes, the same stories over and over. And I would really love to hear from people on the outside. And the people who are by themselves say, I don't want to call and disturb those people because they're so busy with their partners and their families. And I say, no, 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 here's a PSA. Please call them. They are dying to hear from you. They would like nothing more than to hear from you. And so I think there are ways that we can reach out. One of the ways is to reach out to people. Even if you think they don't want to hear from you, you probably are mistaken. And you will discover very quickly who are those people that that really want to hear from you. And you can deepen those relationships in a way that feels very nourishing. And then there are other ways to reach out to people that you don't even know. For example, there are so many people have been so creative during COVID. So there are like online book clubs and online book discussions and online, you know, all different kinds of interests, whatever your interests are. And you'll find that there's another way of connecting that way too. And so I think it's really important to let people know, you know, what are your needs? What are you wanting? And what are the way and be creative about the ways of getting that. And then also, I would just say that piece about solitude is that um, I think that sometimes we don't know how to be alone with ourselves in a way that is fulfilling and doesn't feel empty. And so what are the things that you've always wanted to do that you've never done? For some people, they're like pulling out the art supplies. For some people, they are doing some writing. For some people, they're doing more cooking. You know, whatever it is, what are the ways that you really enjoy being alone with yourself? How can we learn how to do that a little bit better too? Okay. Another question. Regarding ending of life, a patient's presenting symptom is a desire to die, to be gone from this world. He, she wants your assistance because they can't do this alone. How would under, how would you, I think, understand this problem and how would you treat it? To what end? Mm-hmm. Well, I think I need to know a lot more about where that person is and how they came to that decision. So that would be a really hard question to answer unless I knew more about 
that situation. So for example, in the book, Rita comes to me and she wants to die in a year of her situation doesn't change. And what we worked on that year was about, well, what is this really about? And for her, it was really about a sense of hopelessness, a sense of, you know, I've made so many mistakes in my life. And one of them was that her adult children are estranged from her. And she made many mistakes as a parent a long time ago. She is divorced. Um, she has regrets about, you know, different different relationships and certainly about her kids and she wants their forgiveness and they don't want to give it to her. And it really became for her about learning to forgive herself and being the parent that she could be now to them, which is what they really needed and not wanting um, revisionist history, not wanting to go back and do something where you can't have a redo. So it, it really depends on the situation. And for her, she became, you know, there was, there was a lot of hope for her future after we really understood what that hopelessness was about and what that desire to die was about. Okay. What do you think of online therapy and how does one find a compatible therapist? Yeah. So it's funny because originally, you know, in the book, I talk about how um, a colleague of mine had said that doing Skype therapy was like doing therapy with a condom on, right? Which is, <laughs> which is maybe <laughs> not, not the, the greatest analogy here, but, um, but the point is that there, nothing can really replace, um, what it's like to sit in a room with another person, the intimacy of that, right? Where, you know, like right now we can't see people's entire body. So if their foot is shaking as they're telling me that they're not anxious, I don't see the foot shaking on Zoom. Um, I don't see that online, right? Um, but I think also there's just a different energy to what it's like to sit a few feet away from somebody and to hear them breathe and hear the same sounds in the room and to know that you're the only two people in that room together. Um, it feels very different than something that's mediated by a screen. And yet I've been really surprised when we had to move to online therapy during covid where you can find a different kind of intimacy. So for example, a lot of people don't have privacy and they need to find a private place to do their therapy. So often it ends up being in the bathroom, uh, sitting on a, a toilet with the seat down. And one woman was talking about how her mother was in a in a nursing facility and somebody had a confirmed case of COVID there and she was really worried that her mother was going to die and she was sobbing and she was sitting on the toilet and she leaned back and accidentally flushed the toilet. And there's just the whole, the, this whoosh sound filled the space between us. And I didn't want to laugh because of course, what she was talking about was very serious. And she said, you know, am I the only person who does therapy on the toilet? And I said, no, the, the toilet has become the new couch. And I regretted saying that because I thought it sounded too glib given what we were talking about, but oh. she laughed. And then I laughed and she said to me at the end of that session, she said, you know, what you said was really helpful, but what helped me the most was that we were able to laugh together. And she said, I hadn't heard myself laugh in so long. Mm. And it reminded me of who I was before this all happened, but also who I still am, what makes me human. And so I think those moments that we have that we wouldn't have had if we had been in the room together, it would have played out very differently. Um, show that there is some value to what happens when you go into people's personal spaces. There was someone that I had seen for years who all of a sudden there was this cello in the background when I was seeing her. And I said, whose cello is that? And she said, it's mine. I, I play for you know an hour every day. And I thought, wow, I didn't even know that piece of this person's life. So, um, And I think there's this great leveling that happens too, where they're inside my home and I'm inside there. So I think there have been some, you know, some silver linings to doing therapy in this way. Okay. Um, I had a big success in my life recently. When I shared the accomplishment with my partner, she was underwhelmed. Should I expect more support from her or am I overthinking? Yeah. So a lot of times people are surprised by the reactions of people when something people close to you when something good happens. And that's because um, sometimes it's hard for people to do, to deal with maybe envy. Um, sometimes it also changes what we call the homeostasis in the system. So the, the way the system had been was, you know, you didn't have that thing. You didn't have that success. And now all of a sudden somebody becomes successful and it changes the balance in the relationship or in the family system. And I think we really need to look at that. It's not that, that your partner may be, you know, isn't on some level um, glad for you, but I think there's probably a lot of complicated feelings there. And the more that you can talk about what those complicated feelings are, 
um, the more that that you guys will be able to, um, you know, to see the situation more clearly, and that and that your partner will be able to feel grateful um, and 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 feel glad for you as well. Uh, an example of this is like somebody says, you know, um, they're going to stop drinking, right? And so the whole family has been, you know, really focused on getting that person to stop drinking. So the person stops drinking and then all of a sudden that person becomes the healthy person and everybody else has to look at, well, what else wasn't working here? What's, what's not working in my life? And it was so much easier to focus on what wasn't working in somebody else's life. So sometimes we say we want the other person to do well, but yet, you know, sometimes it, it, it's not really that great for us. And so really just asking, you know, what, what was your reaction to that when I told you this? Mm -hmm. As a therapist or as a therapist who was in therapy, is, do you ever just sit in front of your therapist or have somebody sit in front of you and say, I'm done, I'm fine, and just quit therapy just like that because they think they're cured? Does that happen? Is that a good idea? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the goal. It's sort of like as a parent, your goal is to raise people who will become independent and not need you in the same way. Mm -hmm. The same thing happens as a therapist. Our goal is for people to leave. Um, and so, you know, and I think that people don't realize that. I think there's some misunderstanding about therapy that you're going to go to therapy, you're going to talk about your childhood ad nauseum, and you're never going to leave. And that's what therapy is. That's not at all what therapy is. First of all, therapy is focused very much on the present. And sure, we look at how something from the past might be getting in the way or keeping you stuck in the present. But we really want to focus on the present so that you can create a better future. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other misconception is that we, you know, that, that people aren't, aren't going to leave. And we very much want you to be able to get something out of the experience where you aren't going to need us in this way, that you are going to be able to internalize the experience. You're going to be able to trust yourself to make the choices that are going to be healthy for you. Um, and you're going to learn how to navigate through the world more smoothly so that, um, you know, so that you won't need to really come in and, and keep rehearsing that with us. Therapy is pretty much a microcosm of what's going on out in the world. And if you can practice in the therapy room and then translate that out into the world, that is the goal. Okay. Well, before we close, is there anything you'd like to say to all of those listening? Any tips, any summaries, anything you're doing that we should all know about? I would just say that I think this is a really hard time in the world right now and that people are really hard on themselves. And I hope that people will be very gentle with themselves and know that you know, we're all doing great, you know, under the circumstances. And I think every time we think I should be doing more, I should be doing better, I should be more productive, that we really um, sit with the fact that this is a, you know, it's really hard right now. And that under the circumstances, we're all doing great. And I also just want to thank you all for coming and listening. And I hope that this has been helpful in some small way. Wonderful. <laughs> We're glad you, that you joined us, and we ask that you um, consider becoming a member and listening to other uh, virtual events that we have coming up. And again, we rely on your donations. You can donate, you can text to 415-329-4231 or make a donation online. And Lori, thank you so much for joining us. We've had a wonderful time. Thanks. It's fascinating. Thank you so much. Good night.